Well, good morning. It's good to have you with us today. <clears throat> and uh, grateful for the comfort of air conditioning. Uh, hopefully you have it at your home. If not, you're finding a different way to stay cool. And uh, with that, we just want to remind you quickly that uh, we're going to have a swim party and barbecue at the Thornton residence. And uh, they, if you Google their, their address uh, that's uh, provided for you there in the bulletin, it'll actually uh, pull up a Riverside address. So not OMAC, but Riverside. So if you uh, pull those directions up, actually, if you just uh, head up uh, Ross Canyon here and keep on Johnson Creek, you'll run into their driveway. So uh, eventually you'll get there one way or the other. But we're looking forward to that time together. And again, we're going to provide the, the, the meat. And so we've got some chicken thighs and we've got some hot dogs we're going to be sharing together. But we want you to bring the sides. So potato salad, other green salad, other uh, special dessert maybe that you want to share with us uh, that would just sweeten our teeth and tooth and care for us in ways that maybe some of us shouldn't partake, but we're going to anyway. And uh, we'll look forward to that time. If you're not planning on swimming, we still want you to come. There's plenty of space for us to be in the Thornton home in the air conditioning. Uh, a couple different locations there, and they've invited us to be a part of that time. So uh, by all means, uh, we want you to participate however you feel most comfortable in participating in the barbecue and swim party. And then uh, some other things just to be mindful of is that two weeks from this Sunday, uh, we will not be having service, that is Stampede Weekend, but we do encourage you uh, to go to the 830 Western service down at the uh, fairgrounds, or, dare I say this, find another church to go to. <laughs> if there's another church hosting a service, go to that church. Uh, participate in that worship time, uh, pray together with that family, and then come back on the 21st uh, as we continue on uh, with our time together. So two weeks, uh, no church here at Cornerstone, and we're encouraging you to go to the Western Service or uh, find another church in the Okanagan Valley to participate in. And then uh, we, do have, we do not have children's church uh, during this time of uh, our season. And so we do have activity bags that are located over here um, in the back or on the sound booth. And so if you need some, some fidget things for your kids, uh, feel free to grab one of those bags and that would be very helpful for you and your family. And <clears throat> we also want to just uh, be mindful of the fact that as we're moving through the summer that we're, we're praying for our fall. And uh, I want to put uh, some dates in front of you again. September 16, 17, and 18 is going to be our prayer summit. And uh, we want you to be a part of all those times if you possibly can be. If not, then just plug into some times where you're going to be available. We're going to basically have a Friday evening opportunity for us to connect in prayer. And then an all-day Saturday opportunity. So we'll go from in the morning all the way through the afternoon into the afternoon with some lunch and stuff provided there as we move through that summit time. And then we'll conclude with our prayer summit on uh, September the 18th, which is that Sunday morning. And so it's just going to be a great time of us pulling together for prayer and kicking off our fall events and those kind of things. So September 16, 17, and 18 is our prayer summit. And uh, more details to come in regards to that. Well, this uh, time now we're going to transition to a bit of a presentation. This presentation was supposed to take place a couple weeks ago. Uh, but with uh, some, some sickness and some other delays with Conconelli Camp and whatnot, our delegates were out and about, and so we just need some time to kind of gather ourselves together again. But uh, we got to participate in the one conference, which is actually our, our, our annual conference in the Free Methodist Church. And so uh, Heidi and Eric are going to join me up here on the, on the stage, and we're going to take some time to just kind of relay the two and a half days of time together in about five, seven minutes uh, of time, hopefully. And uh, as Eric comes, comes laughing, right? And uh, again, this is uh, not an advertisement for the Free Methodist Church, but to let you know that we are a Free Methodist Church in the Okanagan Valley. And uh, these are our delegates. Um, Heidi is part of our board, and Eric is actually the chair for our board. And uh, both of them went with us. Terry Michelin was supposed to go. Uh, in place of uh, Eric, but she had some family matters she had to sort out. So we had these two go to represent us, Cornerstone, um, at the one conference that was held in Portland. And we'll hear more about why in Portland later, as well as just uh, kind of the themes and uh, what took place there. So 
uh, there's one gospel, there's one church, and there's one mission. That was our focus for the time that we were there. And as we were there, uh, we drew together with four or three other conferences. Uh, one happened to be from the uh, Oregon Conference, the Sierra Pacific Conference, and the Japanese Pacific Conference that came all the way. Uh, two California conferences came to, uh, to Portland to participate in the, the, the one conference. And the scripture focus for that time uh, happens to, to come from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. And, uh, of course, it talks about the, the unity and maturity in the body of Christ. And uh, here is it recorded here. It says, as a prisoner uh, for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope. When you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, which is over all and through all and in all. And so that helped to narrow our focus and bring us in as far as the, the theme and, and, and how to get back to that conversation about one gospel, one church, and one mission. And so I'm going to hand the microphone off to Heidi as she continues on with the presentation. Good morning, church. I want to thank you very much for letting me go to represent you and to bring back this information to you. It was truly a blessed time and a real privilege for me to get to go. I've been a Free Methodist since I was five years old. My mother took our family to the Tenasket Free Methodist Church. I grew up there. I went to college at Free Methodist University. I um, attended church in Free Methodist all of my life. And so it has been what has shaped me and I am so thankful for that I am just so thankful and so I look to see is our leadership still going the same direction as it always has and I really believe it is our bishop is Matt Whitehead he was born three months after me in the OMAC hospital it can't be bad right <laughs> and so um, uh, Starting with our bishop, Matt Whitehead, truly a man of God, searching for God's ways, leading in a, in a tremendous way. Amendments for, for um, superintendents. I'll talk about them more a little bit later. But um, why did we go to Portland of all places? I mean, that's what, that was what was on my mind. What am I doing in Portland because of what I hear from the news, what Portland is like? Well, Portland was in its beauty. I didn't see anything except some graffiti that would tell me that it was anything but 2022 20, there. And, um, and so I sat and I waited um, Thursday morning before we went down to the conference. And I put it before the Lord, what are we doing in Portland? On our way there, we'd locked the keys in the car, had to wait. A Angelo, yeah, the Angelo said that Portland was the arm, armpit of America. So <laughs> what are we doing in Portland? Well, I was with great anticipation, and my, an my anticipation was not let down at all. We really saw the hand of the Lord work there, and um, we, we know why we went to Portland now. Yeah, I suppose that probably is one of the things that crosses all of our minds uh, these days is when you're talking about where you're at. So uh, the, the best part of Portland was uh, early Thursday morning, we were invited to be part of a prayer walk. Uh, so we and uh, Pastor Mike and I actually went and maybe another 30, 35 people that were showed up for the conference early enough to go. Uh, started at the hotel, and then we walked around to about a mile and a half course, praying over the city and praying over the conference that was about to come. Um, and there were a lot of uh, things that you would expect to see, uh, having the knowledge that it was Portland. Not a whole lot different than what you might think it was going to be if you were just walking around Okanagan County, because every... Uh, municipality, I think, has the same challenges with uh, those that are on the fringes and, and those that are lost and, and those of us that are trying to figure out how to navigate that uh, with love as we are called to do. So um, 
I'm going to hand this back to Heidi and let her talk about the superintendents, and then I'll, I'll come back and tell you some more details. Okay. Um, we got to hear each, <coughs> each superintendent speak um, the first day. And Mark Adams, he's from the Sierra Pacific Conference. And um, he really talked a lot about breaking out of our conventional way of doing things, getting outside the box, looking outside the box, and giving people a voice and inviting people to the table and uh, not just being our narrow little way of doing things. The superintendent I enjoyed listening to the most was Keith Tahida. He was the Japanese man from the Japanese uh, conference, and he told us the history of the conference, of how there had been, um, how they'd gone to the camps, you know, during World War II, and things happened. And then when they came back, there were five white women who started five Japanese churches. And that became the Japanese conference. And I just was, I was, I was just, I was just thrilled to hear how God used white women to bring Japanese, and um, it was really interesting. And he talked about his church. Um, Michael Forney, of all four, he he was the worker bee of the four. Uh, he is the man who is uh, working to build the church and has a heart. He had a personal um, crisis, and yet God has used him and, and built him up, and there's no weakness in him. His brokenness has brought him back stronger, I think, and um, his, his uh, work he's, um, shows the most growth. When it was time to ordain pastors, he had the most or to ordain. When it's time to uh, admit uh, conference members, he had the most, he'd done the most work, it looked like, of, of building up people and multiplying, like we're going to talk about. So the report was that there's two new churches in our conference, and there's five apostolic initiatives, which are church starts, kind of. And then there's 18 more calls of um, church plants to be made. And so that seemed like a lot. Then uh, Rob Roy Ranger, his name kind of said it all. He was quite the character. <laughs> um, he's from the Oregon Conference, and he talked about having the Holy Spirit's power in our work and the filling of the Holy Spirit to carry out the work. That evening, there was uh, two speakers from I'm not, one of the California conferences, Benjamin and Sonny, and they brought the pastors together in a an incredible time. The worship was just, it, it, was, it was just outstanding, and it just opened our hearts and our minds to hear God's word, and it was to refresh the pastors, and he ta ta they talked about, um, you know, being a pastor is hard. They listen to everyone else's sorrows, and, their, and he, he works with other people in their brokenness, and how so often the pastors are broken, too. And so it, they just brought about a time when they opened the altar for pastors to come for renewal. And there were pastors running to the altar. There were pastors standing where the hands receiving. And they called it the Holy Spirit sabbatical. That they were, they were the pastors was just received such an incredible um, time of renewal and refreshment. And, and it prepared all of our hearts for the next two days. Well, thank you, Heidi. Um, so that was Thursday, basically, in a nutshell. Uh, Friday was a long day. Uh, we were fortunate that we didn't stay at the hotel, and I say that tongue-in-cheek because there were some traffic issues, but uh, not having to spend those extra hours at the hotel, I think, was probably uh, beneficial to us. Anyhow, there were some breakouts uh, on Friday, and they included... Uh, individual sessions on the basic themes of the conference, which were one spirit, one gospel, and one church. And then there was a business meeting breakout for each of the conferences. So those were rotated around uh, during the course of the day. Uh, one spirit was led by Gerald Coates and Eric Spangler, who are uh, missionaries and leaders of missionary movements, uh, some of which are uh, in 
countries where we don't talk about that because they're simply not welcome there. Uh, but the focus there was on uh, 40 days of fasting and prayer. And they have found that that sort of physical fasting for 40 days along with prayer has generated uh, quite a bit of uh, rejuvenation within the church and success within their areas. So they spoke on that. Uh, and one of the uh, main quotes there was, alone we can go fast, but together we can go far. So again, we're playing on the theme of unity there. Uh, one church was uh, led by Fraser Venter, who is the Love Driven Justice Catalyst, that's his title uh, for the Free Methodist Church, and his job is to uh, basically to go around, monitor, and uh, help guide and lead churches, conferences, um, networks in how we as a Free Methodist Church espouse love driven justice, which is one of our basic Free Methodist ways. I also have uh, a, a little sidebar here. This was not discussed at the conference, but your impact council has been working on a situation for love-driven justice for uh, over a year uh, as the uh, justice network may have been something that some of you heard about or saw some videos online, and I know there's been some, uh, some of our congregation that have taken exception to some of those things. So as an impact council, uh, we came back to the conference and asked them uh, what the deal was there, basically, and what they what they came back with was not from the conference level, but it was from uh, Bishop Matt Whitehead from the from the Free Methodist Church level, uh, and we were able to have a Zoom meeting with him and express our concerns. And uh, the Impact Council was fairly satisfied that. Uh, the Free Methodist Church had the same viewpoint that we did on many of these videos. Uh, it was a nice conversation. Uh, Bishop Matt was thankful that we wrote them a letter and, and talked to them uh, in love rather than lashing out like some people within the denomination had over what they didn't understand. Uh, and we also were uh, able to be uh, satisfied with the response that the church has going forward uh, regarding how they're going to deal with the Justice Network as it continues to uh, evolve. Know that uh, the church does not espouse them. They did not give them permission to use the Free Methodist name, and that's one of the main things that came from this entire conversation is that going forward, uh, anybody that wants to use that Free Methodist name is going to have to meet some standards that align themselves with the Free Methodist Church and the Book of Discipline and, and the, the fact that we are a biblically-based uh, denomination. So I have, I have the letter uh, that summarizes the meeting that we had, and I also have uh, a response that we're going to be sending here shortly to let them know that we will continue to follow up on this situation and make sure that you guys are all continue to be informed. So. That's a sidebar. You guys can ask for that. Anything you want, it's all public knowledge within the church. Um, the third breakout was one gospel. Larry and Deb Blockemeyer are uh, pastors from a Southern California church that have evolved into a team of church planters. And uh, this was one of the biggest things because our mandate here is to have 120 new expressions of church by 2030. And how we're going to do that remains uh, to be seen and, and understood. And so these can be virtual churches. They can be house churches. As Heidi said, there's already 18, uh, 18 starts basically going on besides the five that are, that are pretty much in the books. But they came, there's some very interesting things here. So um, in Acts 9.31, there were apostles and there were ordinary people. You don't have to be anybody special to be part of a church plant. God's plan is multiplication, not addition. So when we, when we help build disciples, we want to make sure that those disciples are built to be able to build more disciples. We don't just add a person. We add somebody that can add more people. So um, in Ezekiel 47.9, uh, it talks about water and, and the flow of the river flowing. And so what they discovered in their movements towards building more churches is that we don't want to be a lake church where people come and go to the banks of the lake. We want to be a river church that flows among the people 
and gives opportunity for everybody on downstream to have the kind of love for God that we want to show. So there are basically seven different shifts that we have to uh, focus on within the Free Methodist Church for that. The first shift is a shift in the scorecard. This is not about how many people are attending your church. It's about how many people leave the church and take the word of God out into the field. The second shift is a shift in empowerment for the mission. Don't rely on programs, but rely on prayer and fasting. So this kind of ties into the uh, Eric Spangler and Gerald Coates that we are only going to achieve these goals through prayer and, and fasting. Uh, number three, a shift in the hero story for the primary leader. Uh, we need to shift from being a hero to being a hero maker. And if you want some more background on that, the scripture is Matthew 20, 28. Number four, a shift in the expectation of every believer. As people that attend church, we should be shifting from a consumer mentality for uh, as w what do I get out of church on Sunday to a uh, disciple making disciples. You want to walk out of here with something that you can hand off to your brother or sister outside of this church that you know needs to hear what Jesus has to offer. A shift in opportunities for every believer, a shift from volunteers in the church to missionaries in the world. Kind of goes along with number four, but you get, the, you get the picture here. We want to take what we have within this building, what we have within this body, and spread it out amongst those people. Number six is a shift in the operating system. You can do it, and we can help. So this is not just pastoral and... Uh, 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 What's the word that I'm looking for? Uh, ministerial people within the church that can do these things. But every one of you is able to do those things. We take volunteers and we equip them and train them and send them out gladly. And then number seven is the shift in the models of our church. A shift from complex and expensive to simple and financially liberated. So again, those iterations of church that we're talking about might just be a home church that meets with 20 people. That may change over time. Hopefully they will multiply and create more churches. It could be a virtual church that no, nobody does anything except online and maybe they meet once a quarter. There's any number of ways that you can do this without having to have the, the wonderful building and facility that we're sitting in right now. One of the big things that they talked about was your community is a waffle, it's not a pancake. So <laughs> the, the, the analogy here was you can't just take Jesus syrup and, and pour it over your community and expect that it's going to eventually reach the edges of the pancake here. We have all kinds of different pockets of different people, of different needs, of different uh, economical backgrounds, not to mention ethnic and cultural, that, that we have all kinds of different needs. So we can't just use the idea that it's going to eventually flow to everybody as part of our model. And I guess that's probably about it. I've talked way too much. That was the breakouts. That was a lot to take in, and it was a big day. But we did have a breakout for our, our business, for our Pacific Northwest business. And one of the biggies for us as a church was that our Matthew Winter was uh, voted in as a, a ministerial candidate. So we have the video that he presented because he couldn't be in person. That was <laughs> that is what we've been working for for so long. And um, we learned when we went searching for pastoral candidates for our church that you have to basically grow your own these days because people that grow up in the big city don't necessarily look at OMAC as a great place for ministry. <laughs> and so we... Uh, because it's a long ways from grandmas and a lot of other things that hold people to not come here. But um, we are, uh, have reached out, and God has sent us this wonderful man from uh, South Africa. And so he is officially a conference member, and the next step is ordination. And we got to s see the ordination in our uh, conference in our valley, uh, Matt Carroll. 
was ordained as a as an elder in the Free Methodist Church. He's the Tenasket um, youth pastor, co-pastor this year, and next year he will be the pastor in Tenasket. And it's it's a wonderful story because uh, Mac is a Tenasket high school graduate and has been raised in the Free Methodist Church in Tenasket and knows our values and 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 knows the impact that we can have in this valley. And, and God has called him, and it's, it was a really a wonderful thing to see that happen. Another, uh, the other thing of business is we voted on delegates uh, to general conference, and our own Eric Hine is voted as an alternate to the conference next year, and it's a general conference. Every conference of the Free Methodist Church in the United States gets together in Florida, and um, so that's what's coming up. So Eric... We think he gets to go even as an alternate. We're hoping we can send him there. Okay. Uh, and then the last one. <laughs> so Saturday was uh, very uh, informative and, again, stuck within our theme of uh, one church, one gospel, uh, and, and general theme of unity. And so for those of you that don't know, uh, Seattle Pacific University has been under fire for standing up to uh, the, the student body and, and some of the faculty there that wanted a little different response to social justice than, than what they have agreed to because they have decided that they are going to stand their ground and maintain a, a biblically based uh, way of running their school and so they're not accepting uh, same-sex marriage issues and, and things like that. So um, Pastor uh, Refugio Sanchez has been brought in as an interim uh, president there, and uh, the idea, I think, is that he's there another year. But he was really very eloquent about stating uh, what is happening in that uh, area and in that type of uh, institution that they would maintain uh, the biblical standards that Seattle Pacific University is founded on. So uh, along with the, the social or the justice network issue that we talked about a little bit earlier, I, we, we feel really confident that uh, the free Methodists are not backing off from what their foundational principles are, and that was really exciting to hear. Uh, the rest of the speakers that day were all um, talking about the, the forced first four verses of Ephesians that Pastor Mike read and it got to each break down and uh, there was a lot of uh, heartfelt exploration uh, from the individuals for what it meant for their individual journey to become pastors within the Free Methodist Church. We got to see it from a, uh, a varied standpoint and I'm, I'm certain that this was you know, orchestrated purposefully so that we could see uh, a, a white woman and a Samoan man and uh, a Vietnamese woman. And so every, every one of these stories was critical, I think, for the understanding of everybody there that it doesn't matter what your background is, what you come from, that when you're called by the Lord and you are hold firm to his principles, with the help of others that love Jesus, this is what can happen to our community. So um, it was really very inspirational. And then, did you want to say the last one, or am I supposed to continue on here? If, if you're fine with that, I have Micah 6.8 ready to read when you, when you want to. So uh, I wanted to say thank you to Heidi and Eric for taking the time to share. I know that for some of you, you're like, well, I didn't come in here for this this morning. But this is an important part of who we are as the body of Christ here at Cornerstone. And there are a lot of things that go on behind the scenes oftentimes that you're not aware of that these two help pray for, intercede for, and carry us forward in, in, many, in ministry and mission. And so continue to pray for these two here, and then we also have others who are part of our Impact Council that didn't get to go along to Portland, but uh, they are still standing in the gap for you as a Cornerstone family. And standing for the principles we've been talking about, standing as one, the understanding of that community. And um, 
So Bishop Whitehead uh, kind of uh, just laid it out there for us and that we are being reminded of the fact that uh, uh, we, we want to be that movement of bring, bringing the, the Holy Spirit into our lives first and foremost personally, but then collectively as the body of Christ. And uh, to become that Holy Spirit-filled movement uh, to multiply and to reach out, but keeping in mind as we started with the theme of of, uh, of just recognizing that there's one gospel, one church, and one mission. And uh, that was his focus. That was what he, he, he shared with us, and we're so grateful for that. And so, Eric, if you'll read Micah 6.8. Micah 6.8 8 says, Hello. Uh, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Well, Father, we come before you this morning, and we're so grateful, Lord, for how you're using this body here in the Okanagan Valley, Lord, to be a blessing here as well as beyond. And, Father, we are going to take this time now, Lord, just to lift praise on behalf of your name, the one true God the one that drives our mission, the one that drives our church, the one that we lean into, Lord, for uh, provision and purpose and understanding, Lord, of how to, to be effective here in the Okanagan Valley with discipleship and, and uh, evangelism and outreach and, and multiplication. And Father, we need your help. We need your guidance. And uh, so use this time now, Lord, to bring our hearts together, to unify us in this time of worship. We pray these things in your mighty name. Amen and amen. Good morning. We're going to start with a hymn today, actually, um, a worship hymn. So um, go ahead and join with us. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin, thinking uh, what Heidi said about sometimes pastors are broken too, and I was thinking that's, um, it's cool, because we don't have to be perfect to serve God, 
So God uses broken people, obviously. None of us are perfect. But sometimes we like have to feel like, but God uses broken people. So don't feel like you have to be at some certain level of holiness to help out in the church and to, you know, do things because I don't always feel that holy. <laughs> but here I am. <laughs> and you're stuck with me because I have a microphone. <laughs> but anyways, so um, the last song that we're going to sing before the pastor comes back is um, What a Friend in Heaven. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often for. Well, pray with me. Father God, we say thank you for the reminder of what you've done for us just in these few songs we've sung, how you've given your life, how you've provided everything we need for life and godliness. You've given us everything, Lord God, to, to walk in righteousness and your holiness, and your life has been given for us. And Father, this morning you're calling us to surrender our lives in deeper ways today than we did yesterday or the day before or even last week. Father, because uh, as we are believers in you, we know that you will challenge us 
to take the faith steps we're supposed to at just the right time we're supposed to. Because you're the God that will nudge us. You will push us, Lord, into those places and encourage us, Lord, to take the faith steps, to, to know that only you can provide, that only you can get us to the place where we need to be. Because it's your hand that will guide. It's your hand that will provide. It's your hand, the hand that will provide the strength. And you'll provide us with the discernment and the wisdom to navigate life circumstances. Lord, we're just thankful for new life, for, for birth, for, for spiritual birth as well as just for physical birth. And for a new baby here in our sanctuary this morning, Lord. And how that reminds us of just the, the physical presence, Lord, of each person here. And how you are stewarding each one of them, Lord, for your purpose. Lord, may they hear the calling of their lives. Lord, may they recognize that they are the, the priesthood of all believers, Lord, that it's not just Pastor Mike's show, but it's, it's us together as a body, as believers, as trusting you first and foremost. And Lord, this morning we say thank you so much for the way you're providing for us in this, this, this heat. We pray, Lord, for those who are having to work out today in the heat or in this next week or that have worked, Lord, in this past week. And Lord, just grateful for your hand protection upon and your watch care over. Father, there are many other wounds and hurts and, and concerns, Lord, that this family brings in this morning. And so we just pray, Lord, that each one would be faithful to lift those concerns to you that they know that there's a God that listens, that, that cares for them, that's not dead, that is available to each and every need that they have. And Father, thank you so much for the way that you are going to lead and guide now. Lord, use your word to steer us, Lord, closer to you during this time. Move me out of the way, move the distractions in our home out of the way, and just allow this, Lord God, to be a time where your word is is illuminated in our lives, where it comes alive, where it penetrates into the places it needs to, because we've maybe calloused our heart, Lord. We've, we've maybe uh, gained some bitterness. We maybe have taken offense of something, Lord, and, and today is that day we've got to lay those things down, because you're going to challenge us with those things. And so I pray, Lord, that you prepare us, prepare our hearts, Lord, for this time of encounter around your word. Lead and guide us now. We pray these things in your holy name. Amen and amen. So I'm trying to keep mindful of the time uh, because uh, some of us uh, have other places to be and other things to do, uh, but I don't want to rush too quickly through this uh, Romans chapter 14, but I will encourage you to go ahead and open up there this morning uh, before we get into that reading. And I just want to remind you of uh, where we've been and kind of why we're wrestling with this survey of Romans. And first of all, it's because there's some major themes uh, that we've been working with in regards to the way that Paul addresses the church. And uh, here's some of those themes. First of all, liberty versus bondage, faith versus works, spirit versus the flesh, and victory versus defeat. As we've been working through these last 13 chapters, and you've been here with us, or you've been watching online, you'll notice that there's the repeated themes that come up in here that Paul points to and wants to keep on that, that front edge of, of consideration for us. And then he's also been uh, given, we've given some reasons as to why he would write specifically about some things. And first of all, to clarify the gospel, that there's one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus, uh, who laid down his life, who has provided everything for us, uh, to discuss God's righteousness, to discuss his righteousness and how uh, with his righteousness we're able to effectively be uh, all that he has asked us to be because of what he's provided, and to unify the church, to bring the church together. And if uh, there's nothing else more than what we're going to need today, is we're going to need to focus in on this part of the, uh, the reasons for Paul writing today is to unify the church. Church, we, we don't take very long to start pointing out other people's flaws and other people's issues and concerns when it's a di in a different camp. And uh, I know that there are some things that uh, we wrestle with and we wonder about and we're, we're trying to consider but one of those things that if we keep front and center is if Jesus is our all in all and we have our eyes fixed on him, then that is what we rally around. That's what unifies us as a church, right? 
Uh, I just uh, got to spend some time with my wife and the, the fur babies uh, over in the Methow Valley the last few nights and enjoyed that time. And uh, we have a, a border collie that loves to fetch the frisbee. And uh, he will t- toss that thing and toss that thing. And he, he, he will lay down occasionally because he gets a little bit tired and pooped. But he'll pick it up and keep going, right? Well, I got tired of throwing the frisbee, so I put the frisbee up in the tree. And I put the frisbee up in the tree high enough to where I thought for sure he wasn't going to be able to get to it. And, uh, and then all along, here comes the wind. And uh, the wind blows down through uh, the trees, and the frisbee starts to flop around there a little bit, and the dog's all down the tree just waiting for it to fall. Eventually, it trickles down, and he's able to get his frisbee. Of course, I have to throw it some more times and whatnot. Well, Bethany got a hold of frisbee, and she put it higher into the tree than I put it in the tree, and he went over, and his focus was so laser-fixed on that frisbee. He'd prance around the tree, this direction, that direction, and there was a tree potentially he could have climbed up, but, you know, he wasn't reasoning that way. He wasn't thinking that way. He's just seeing the, the prize in the tree. He was seeing that frisbee is what he wanted. That's what he was going for. He didn't care that that brown lab that was with us was with us or not. He didn't care if mom and dad were sitting in the river. He didn't care about any of those things. He was focused on the frisbee in the tree. Well, the wind didn't blow hard enough for that frisbee to blow down and come out, but eventually Bethany gave in and allowed him to have the frisbee again so we could keep throwing the frisbee. I bring that analogy up is because we've got to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith, right? And there are so many distractions at times that come in around us that we get, it get, gets lost. And, uh, and if we don't stand in that firm foundation of what Christ has called us to, the righteousness that he provides, and the, the unity he brings around the church, we can start biting and picking and pointing fingers and all kinds of different stuff at brothers and sisters that we should not. We are a free Methodist church. That doesn't mean that we bash on the Baptist church or the Presbyterian church or so on. We are brothers in Christ. In fact, I meet with the pastors here locally uh, twice a month to pray. And so when I say that we're not meeting on August the 14th here at Cornerstone and, and go to another church to worship and connect, do that. Be an encouragement to the body of Christ here in the Okanagan Valley. But understanding also that we do have some particulars we're a little different in and that we are a free Methodist church. And uh, if you want to have some further conversation about what we discussed today or, or about what that might mean for you, then, then set up an appointment. Let's have a conversation. I'd love to, to talk, with, talk with you about that further. But, uh, but also then, Paul has been uh, uh, transitioning into this conversation about just the practical way that this theology, right, this, this, uh, this clarity of the gospel is supposed to be playing out in our lives. And he started back in Romans chapter 12 in these uh, seven verses when he said this. He said, love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. And do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not think of yourself higher than someone else, right? We have a problem with that here in America. We have a problem with that here in the United States. And it seeps its way into the body of Christ. Just like Paul was pointing out here in this body of Christ, as he was speaking to them, there was a recognition that uh, there were some who were thinking more highly than they ought. There are some who are boasting more about themselves than giving glory to the Lord. And when we get caught up in that, it affects the church. It affects the church's witness. It affects the the way that we're able to go out and effectively make disciples. We're able to advance the gospel, that we're able to share the life transformation that we've been able to experience because some of these other things blow us up. We get super excited about how much more we know about the next-door neighbor. Or we get super excited about, oh, well, well we can rant about this on Facebook. Or, hey, we, we, the list kind of goes on. But if we keep the main thing the main thing, and that is Jesus, focused on Jesus, then we should not see anything other than Jesus in our life, right? We should not be presenting a different gospel other than what Jesus presented. But that is, again, why 
Paul talks us back into it, right? Brings us back into it, reminds us of the role that we have. And then in Romans chapter 13, uh, verse 14, our memory verse uh, for this past week also reminds us of just that, that transformational living and how differently we should perceive things. Does anybody have Romans chapter 13, verse 14 memorized this morning that you want to share with us? Go ahead. Good job. Fantastic. Yes. Another one over here. Yep. A little different translation. Yes. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Old folks rock. There you, there you go. Are you saying young minds? Young minds can't memorize scripture? Is that, is that now we're not pointing that out, right? Okay. Uh, us, us youngins, uh, yeah. Uh, where are we? Huh? Okay. All right. Fantastic. We'll keep working on the, the memory verses. There will be another presenter here this morning before you leave uh, that you can work on in this next week. Well, my message title for today is the Lord of both the dead and the living. And uh, before we actually get into to the real theme and nuts and bolts of this, is I want to I throw a question out there at you. It says, are there any unresolved conflicts that need your attention? Whether it be in the church, whether it be personally with uh, someone in your family, uh, someone in the community, or whatnot. And, and what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about that conflict? How are you going to address that situation? Are you going to continue to ignore it? And it festers, it feeds anxiety, whenever you see that person or you talk about that situation, it just, the conflict just agitates more and more. Or are you going to be at a place where you're going to move towards someone or you're going to re re resolve within you to lay that situation down? Maybe you've already gone to that person and you've asked for forgiveness, you've extended yourself and you said, hey, I blew it, I made a mess. But there still feels like there's that conflict, right? Some of you are like, I love conflict. I love going after it. I love getting to the details. I love getting to the nut and bolts. And the rest of it is like, boom, I'm out. As soon as you get a little sniff of conflict, you're moving on, right? And, uh, and, and recognizing that that's the way we can navigate also uh, in the body of Christ. That when there's something maybe that Pastor Mike doesn't say correctly, or maybe there's a worship song we don't sing correctly, or maybe there's a, someone sitting in your pew in the spot that you normally sit in, and you come in, and all of a sudden there's someone sitting there. How do you deal with that, church? Do you move on? Or do you fe does it fester? Does it chew you up? Does it say, you know what? I'm not going to go back to that church until I sing this song. Or I'm not going to go back to, 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 to listen to pastor until he corrects this. Well, you're a mess and I'm a mess, right? Uh, Angel just pointed it out that I'm not perfect. There are going to be some things sometimes that I say that I do that, 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 that you can even take out of context, right? Like, you go online, you watch my messages, you listen to the sermons. There's a number of times, I'm sure, that you, if you just snip it at a certain spot, you can take that and you can fling it all over the place and pull me out of context. But if you're here, you're full of the, with us journeying together, we recognize we're the body of Christ together, then you're going to know what Pastor Mike typically would say about the situation. And if you don't, then set up an appointment and let's talk about it. Because maybe I haven't addressed it directly to you or, or as directly as what you want. But that doesn't mean that I don't want to talk about it. It just means there's a whole lot of other things that other people want to talk about. Oh, we've got to talk about prophecy. Or we've got to talk about this. We've got to talk about that. We've got to talk about end times. We've got to... Fine. But on a Sunday morning when we come together, we try to keep the word central. The word central, right? And so when we... we Going through this uh, survey of Romans, we're understanding there are going to be some times where you might get agitated about some things. I, here's here's a, a, a slide here that might agitate you. I don't know. I took on a steak eating contest when I was in Portland. Um, I love steak, and uh, I, I found that as we were journeying to Portland for this conference, that, that I could take on a 72-ounce steak now, if you see the picture up there, you'll see it looks like a pot roast, right? Like that baby was that much high off the plate. And, uh, 
And uh, I, I'm going to tell you it was $75 worth of, worth of meat and food, right? And I'm also going to tell you that I was doing it while we're there to be a part of the, the one conference. And so some of you are like, man, he spent way too much money on that, that, that meal. Some of you are like, man, I can't believe he, what a gluttony. He, he wanted to try to eat all those 72 ounces, right? The, the things that kind of run through your mind could cause all kind of conflicts and concerns in regards to your pastor, right? Well, can I tell you I got 54 ounces of the 72 ounces into my gullet, along with 10 fries, uh, some, some, some side uh, kind of veggie type things and whatnot, and I called her quits. I didn't get all the way through the 72 ounces. In fact, the other ounces we took home, we had them breakfast the next few mornings uh, so it could spread out that $75, right? But here's the deal. I had saved to have that meal because I knew we were going that direction. So I was able to um, give cash towards the meal that was in my pocket that I was able to cover the meal with and recognize that I got, got to the place where I thought I was going to get beyond and I'm like, nope, I, I want to be miserable for this one conference the rest of the time. Now, some of you are really envious because you want to do that. You want to sit down with that 72-ounce steak and you want to give it a try, right? When you're in Portland next, go ahead and, and move on to sailors, and they will provide you that 72 ounces and an hour to eat it. Uh, I ate for 40 minutes and uh, found myself at the end. But even in me sharing this little context, uh, there could be conflict within you like, well, I don't eat red meat, right? Why does that pastor eat red meat, right? Um, <clears throat> the list can kind of go on. Well, I want to get back to our theme this morning and uh, recognize that as we're here, that the Lord is, uh, he is both the, the Lord of both the, the dead and the living. And uh, he's, he's both uh, uh, the, the Lord of the dead and the living when we put preferences and our opinions aside. Let's take in the first four verses here in this chapter uh, 14 where it says this, starting in verse 1. Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not, and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand for the Lord, and, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. You see, in the midst of this conversation, there are some dietary issues that are being discussed. And the reason these dietary issues are being discussed is because there are some different ways that the Jewish culture that we're talking about, as well as the Gentile culture that we're talking about, clash. And it was coming to a forefront, and so Paul had to speak into this and say, you know what? If you recognize that you can eat that, fine, eat it. But eat it with a clear conscience, knowing that it's, it's not dedicated to an idol, not dedicated to something else, right? If I'd have known that that 72-ounce steak was dedicated to offering up to some other idol, then I ought not eat that. In addition to that, if eating steak is offensive to you, then I should not invite you to be a part of my steak-eating challenge, right? I should not invite you to the table to say, hey, look how much meat I can eat when you are a vegetarian, well, we had vegetarians at the table because the Jews were there, and they recognized that uh, with that, that there's a way that they could avoid the idols by eating the vegetables instead of eating the meat. And so you have all this confrontation going on. You have all this conflict happening because of preference, because of opinion, because of thoughts, right? And Paul's trying to rally him around again and say, no, take your eyes off the other brother and focus on your plate. Focus on you. Focus on what the Lord's doing in your life and how you can express that, right? But we get into these preferences. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 23 and 24, Paul says this. He says, I have every right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. So if your good is trying to affect someone else's good, then you should sit back and as the mature believer and go, oh, I need to care for this person in a different way. I shouldn't be so quick to rush in and give judgment and, and force my opinion. I should take the time to listen 
and to listen to what they have to say and, and how that expression, what's coming out of them, can be spoken into and be encouraged. In fact, uh, Jesus also was talking about this in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, where he says this, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of the sawdust in your brother's eye and, and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brothers, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give the dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to the pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. You see, even within the crowd of the believers, even here today, there are going to be some temptations at times for you to uh, be angry and judge. Maybe you judge someone's outfit when they came in this morning. Maybe you judge how early they got here or how late they got here. Or maybe you'll judge them on the way out of, who knows, right? Or maybe you'll see them in the grocery store and maybe there'll be some sort of casting judgment you have on them because you, you think they went down the wine aisle and bought some wine. Or they went down to this aisle or went on and bought something you wouldn't buy because, you know, you're more holy than that person that bought that item that you don't think they should be buying. And so we have these conversations, and, and all the while, Jesus is saying, hey, you've got stuff in your own camp. you got stuff in your eye. you got stuff in your mind. you got stuff in your thoughts that you've got to get rid of before you can really play out the God card in your backyard and then... Um, it's not so cool, right? Well, also, he is the Lord over the dead. Uh, as our conflicts get resolved, as our conflicts get resolved, when we come together, we realize that there's a, a, a reconciliation can happen between a brother and sister. Then the, the dead is thrown away and the living is brought to life. And we recognize that those conflicts now are no longer the conflicts we once had. They're resolved. They're cared for. Do you fight for that? Do you believe in that? Do you understand that's your role as a believer, or do you just pick and, and choose your battles and then, again, continue that offense and that issue and that hurt? Well, it's a parable I came across called A, a Brawling Bride. And uh, I don't know if you've heard of this uh, from Karen Maines or not before, but she shares, shares this as that, that parable. She says, there's a vivid scene described, uh, describing a suspenseful moment in a wedding ceremony. When... Down front stands a groom in a spotless tuxedo, handsome, smiling, full of anticipation. Shoes shined, every hair in place, anxiously awaiting the presence of his bride. All attendants are in place, looking joyful and attractive, of course. The magical moment finally arrives as the pipe organ reaches full crescendo and uh, the, the, the stately wedding march begins. Everyone rises and looks toward the door for the first glimpse of the bride. When suddenly there is a horrified gasp, the wedding party is shocked. The groom um, stares in embarrassed disbelief. Instead of a lovely woman dressed in elegant white, smiling behind a lace veil, the bride is limping down the aisle. Her dress is soiled and torn. Her leg seems twisted. Ugly cuts and bruises cover her bare arms. Her nose is bleeding, one eye is purple and swollen, and her hair is disheveled. Does not this handsome groom deserve better than this? Asked the author. And then the clincher, alas, his bride, the church, has been fighting again. There was made mention that at the conference that uh, there was some special prayer time for us as pastors. Um, and that prayer time focused around wounds and hurts that pastors journey through as they move through years, decades of ministry. They, they hear turmoil, uh, losing friendships, uh, losing relationships over what matters. People walk away. We get wounded, we get hurt, we get torn up, 
we're human. We hurt just as much as you would hurt if someone decided to, to, to walk away from you in a relationship. And church, we've got to stop fighting with each other. We've got to stop nitpicking and, and, and backbiting and recognize that we're in this together. That the, the bride of Christ, the church collectively, is beat up. We've journeyed through two years of, of, of nastiness, right, with COVID and all the other effects that has taken place. And we don't need to be adding fuel to the fire. The Lord is first and foremost for us. If we're constantly duking it out with each other across the aisle or we're not doing the bride, the church, the benefit that we need to as far as the body of Christ. Well, she goes on to, to, to say this, Karen Maines, that is, if we really loved one another, we would find the grace to agree to disagree. Now, not on the main terms, right? We're not going to disagree on the fact that, that Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. We're not going to disagree on the fact that there's a marriage between a husband and wife. We're not going to disagree on the fact that there's different ways that we are supposed to be navigating when Christ being a part of our life. And that's extending forgiveness and grace and peace and comfort and recognizing that within that, that we have that role to play. Yeah, we're going to disagree at times with other believers. That's just a part of naturally being a part of a family. You have every part of your family that you rub shoulders with routinely, get along all the time. If so, awesome. Fantastic. You're blessed in that family. But I can tell you, more times than not, there's a lot of other strain, a lot of other issues that come up in family. And you got to agree to disagree, right? Uh, but there are some things that you got to stand on as well. How do you stand on that, though? Do you stand on it to win your side, to, to, to prove you're the better one? Or do you take the time to listen and to counsel? And if they want input, you give it. Pastor Leo Lusco says this, if you're just religious and not operating in the presence of God, that is fine, but when you're in the presence of Jesus, you aren't going to walk around with a pumped up chest, but instead you're going to ask, who am I? Who am I in the midst of this? Well, the Lord over the living and the dead also happens when the things that motivate us have kingdom significance. A lot of the, the nitpicking and the backbiting and the, the, the swapping of sheep around in the Okanagan Valley and all over the church is because there's a preference that's not based on kingdom perspective. It's based on that person's perspective, that person's preference to how they worship, to how they serve the Lord, and so on. But recognizing that if there's kingdom significance, then like that Frisbee, we've got our eyes on the prize. If it's worth fighting for, we're going to stand for it. If it's not, we're going to let it float down the river. We're going to give it up. We're going to recognize that, you know what, I can agree to disagree on that. But it's hard for us to say that at times. It's hard for us to acknowledge that at times. Pastor Skip Petzig says this. He says, a man wrapped up in himself makes for a very small package. When it comes to the church, we are not perfect but redeemed people. Hallelujah. We ought to be ready to give up our rights and our status to provide unity in the church. You see, when we recognize there are kingdom significance that we need to stand for, then we recognize that those are things that should be motivating us. And um, verses 11 through 18 say that here. It says this. So then each of us give us an account of ourselves to God. Therefore, let us not stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, sorry, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. I am convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person it is unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you're no longer acting in love. Do not be your... Do, do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves God or serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. 
You see, when you and I stand in, 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 in recognizing the kingdom significance in our conversations, then we can put aside the, 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 the disagreements, but recognizing that Christ brings us together, that his kingdom is important for fighting for. And the last but not least this morning, uh, the Lord over the dead and living is when we, what, it, what motivates us brings peace and mutual edification to the body of Christ. And so to finish out this chapter, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves, but whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat, because their eating is not from faith, and everything that does not come from faith is sin. Well, Paul drives it home and reminds us again that uh, he is the Lord of the living and the dead. In fact, back here in verses uh, 8 and 9, it says, if we, if we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and of the living. Also, James shares this in his third chapter in verses 13 through 18 where he says this in, in, uh, in, uh, in his writing. It says, As who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in, hum in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is, first of all, pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Don't we want to be a part of that conversation? Don't we want to be a part of that, uh, uh, recognizing we're moving forward the bride of Christ as we recognize that Christ is asking us to walk as peacemakers in our conflicts. To, to walk in ways that are considerate, that are submissive, that, that we recognize that he's given this mercy we need to extend to other people. Recognizing that the good fruit that he brings is his good fruit, not our own. Not to be boastful about those things. So I started this morning in sharing this question with us. Are there any unresolved conflicts that need your attention? Is it in your marriage? Is it in your relationship with your kids, your grandkids, someone in the community? The Lord's brought, bringing that to attention now, and he wants you to do something about it. He's going to give you the courage. He's going to give you the strength. He's going to give you the discernment on how to do that. Because there are going to be times where the conflict's going to happen. And how do you stand in the midst of that conflict? Do you get angry? Do you get bitter? Do you fly off the handle? Do you curse someone out? Do you throw things? Or are you in a place where you recognize you're controlled by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit steering you to do something different in the midst of that instead of just be reacting? Instead, be relating to the Holy Spirit, leaning into him, saying, Lord, I need your help right now. I want to say something that's not going to be beneficial. I want to do something that is not going to be helpful. I want to let this person know that, and you pull back and you recognize that it's the enemy within that's causing the confrontation. That you do want to be that peacemaker, that you do want to be that person that the Lord brings to that place where you can walk in a way that you're not adding fuel to the fire, but you're walking in the truth, the way in the life that Christ asked you to. But you can't do that if you're still all caught up in conflict. Well, there's a, a worship song that we, would, we typically sing uh, when Michael and the team are here. And uh, again, I appreciate Angela stepping in and, and uh, leading us in these last few weeks. Just grateful for her leadership. And she's not trying to be uh, a Michael Porter or someone else that she's come in contact with worship. She is herself. 
and she is laying herself before the Lord and recognizing there's gifts that, she, that he's using in her. And we praise the Lord for that. But one of the worship songs that we often sing is, Never Once. It says this, Standing on this mountaintop, looking just how far we've come, knowing that for every step you were with us, kneeling on this battleground, seeing just how much you've done, knowing every victory was your power in us. Scars and struggles are on the way, but with joy our hearts can say, yes, our hearts can say. Then never once did we ever walk alone, never once did you leave us on our own. You are faithful, God. You are faithful. Every step we're breathing in your grace, evermore we'll be breathing out your praise. You are faithful, God. You are faithful. You are you are faithful, God. You are faithful. Praise his name. And then some questions for reflection this morning. Uh, what things are at war within you? What are you wrestling with most this morning about this, this, this encounter with God's word? What's stirred within you? What has caused some agitation maybe? What is warring within you that you need to address and lay before the Father? Uh, how is your fleshly nature an enemy to you? How is your flesh winning? How is the, the motive of your mind overplaying what Christ would have you be concerned about? In which areas of your life do you need more humility? Where in that place do you recognize that you don't have it all figured out? That you need Christ more and more because he can help sort out the things you're not quite sure about. I know I need that on a pretty regular basis. How would you describe your daily walk with Jesus? What does it look like? Again, that's just a conversation between you and the Lord. Are you walking with the Lord faithfully? Are you a believer in him? Do you have regular devotions? Or do you just try to live on what you get on Sunday morning? Or do you space that out and take some time to read separate from Sundays? To take some time to set aside in prayer so you can hear from the Lord? And then, how do you avoid self-righteousness? How do you avoid self-righteousness? How do you put yourself in a place you recognize that there's your will that's prevailing instead of Christ's will that's prevailing? Well, I'm going to invite the worship team up as we go to the Lord in prayer. If there's something that you need to entertain in prayer with the Lord now, we encourage you to do that. So whether that needs to be here at the altar rail or right where you're seated, uh, the Lord is here. He is impressing upon us the need for us to maybe resolve a conflict. Maybe that conflict's with him. Maybe this morning you came in with that conflict against God because he has not worked the way that you wanted him to work. He has not fixed whatever you wanted him to fix. You're still waiting for it. Well, lay yourself before the Lord again because maybe that's the day that, it, that, that he does what he needs to do. Maybe not what you need him to do, but what he needs to do in your life. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for this time. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, we know that uh, within the, the context of this setting and the things that were shared, Lord, that, that you've been tending our hearts. You've been fighting for this family. We, you've been fighting for unity. You've been fighting for purposes, Lord, that are greater than us, that are kingdom purposes as we've been sitting here together, shoulder to shoulder and online. And Father, I pray, Lord, that as the words have gone out and we've taken this time to reflect on Romans chapter 14, Lord, that, that, that this would not just be something that we would, would, would leave here, Lord, that, that, but it would play out in our life, that it would make a difference, it impact us in a different way. Lord, that we would be believers that are hungry, that are fixed on you, that our eyes are so focused on you that the other distractions around us don't matter. Lord, that we understand that you are a focal point. We understand, Lord, that you can help resolve, correct, mend, heal, provide. Father, thank you, Lord, as we've been together, that you've been here with us. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that's been stirring. We, Lord, stirring. we pray, Lord, that, that, that more and more of that would be evident in our lives. That it wouldn't just be something that happens here, Lord, but that we would take you into our homes into our community in this next week, into the places we work and play and, and enjoy the outdoors and shop. Father, we pray that we would be those people that would be your ambassadors, that we'd be your hands and feet, Lord, 
for a, a community that is hurting, that is wounded, that, that, that needs the touch of the church. Lord, may we be the church collectively unified in your name, in your purpose, not on our own. Not to seek our selfish ambition, Lord, but to seek your will. To seek all that you have for us. We pray these things in your mighty name. Amen and amen. Well, memory verse. Actually, two verses I'm going to throw at you this week. I know it's going to be a little bit of a challenge, but uh, I'm sure we can do it. Um, We've got all week. We've got seven days. So just chunk it up a little bit here and there, and uh, we can get it together. Romans chapter 14, verses 8 and 9. If we live, we live for the Lord, and when we die, we die for the Lord. So whether you live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to the life, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. It's a mouthful. Swap them back and forth here and there, but uh, I think we can get it. Uh, Romans 14, verses 8 and 9. I want to share the benediction with you, and then uh, the team is going to close us out on a worship song. Again, we remind you to join us at the Thornton's residence uh, following the service this morning to to join us for some time of barbecue and swimming and whatever other festivities that you want to be a part of, as well as indoors. Uh, Bring a game. Maybe bring a board game to play inside. Uh, Checkers or Risk or I don't know, right? All right, we'll have you stand. I'll share the benediction with you. It comes from Romans chapter 14, these two verses. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I think that's how God looks at us. He like totally laughs when we try so hard and we fail because he knew that we tried and he's happy and that makes him happy and that makes us smile. Um, so don't worry if you make mistakes and stuff. God, I think God just laughs when we sin. Uh, we're going to sing verse 1 and 3 of Oh Say That I'm Glad. And one of the lines in here is abiding in him is a real treat. I love that because nobody says that anymore. <laughs> It just makes me smile because it's just so beautiful. So there is a song in my heart today, something I never had. Jesus has taken my sins away. Good week, and maybe you'll say that.